Yeah, it should be. Right now, it should be like that. Yeah. It's a new one. Everything's there. Advertisement. Just like the Well, it's interesting. It comes along. Oh, yeah. What kind of drink when they're having it? Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. It's the right thing to do. I don't know if people are able to do this. It's a little bit bad. And just said, we do it. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. saying, sorry. I wasn't really worried about it. That was a good tactic. That's definitely true. Yeah. 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 Ye
three two. Did I okay. Oh. What did you, did you vote? Up? I did three two to table. Oh. All right. Okay. Is there a um to a, a motion to approve the agenda as changed? I'd make a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the uh, agenda as amended. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carried 5 0. Are there any, is there anybody here for public comment tonight? Seeing none. On to comment by board members and superintendent. Good video tonight on our mission division. So, hold up the video for us. going down for me, a strategic goal, one, hedgehog, um, engagement. Student, uh, strategic plan community share outs, just want to thank our leadership team. They've been continuing to community share outs about what our strategic plan is and uh, around our metrics and our goals. So Marsha and Justin presented at Rotary, and we have a team presenting via Zoom to some community leaders tonight, so appreciate that. Uh, strategic goal, hedgehog, two, equity. We wanted to give a board update on summer meals. Uh, again, 100% paid school lunch program will be ending this year. Um, and so the recommendation for us will be to return back to normal summer lunch. So normal summer lunch looks like this. We can't do deliveries and we can't do the grab and go. It has to be by federal regulations, it has to be uh, you know located at a site. So people have to come and show up. And then our uh, recommendation is to end it June 30th. We don't have high participation in July. And quite honestly, our lunch staff needs a break. Uh, they, they've worked um, full summer for several years now. And we, we appreciate everything they've done. Uh, strategic goal has all three leadership advancement vision. Um, we've been to, um, more of our community engagement office, uh, which Justin leads. We're finding that we're really moving more into what we call advancement, which is much like what a college does that philanthropy, recruitment of new families. We've been working with a lot of our corporate uh, partners, and that includes the uh, Area Development Corporation about how we can. Um, be at the forefront of offering community tours, getting more families to come in. And we're also talking about possible partnerships, maybe helping them compensate for the time we do. We get new uh, families coming in for some of the corporations and we're doing tours and stuff for them on the weekends. And we're like, well, maybe we can make that an official partnership. So I'll have more uh, information on that, but having just some informal discussions with some community leaders. Uh, also about leadership rag ride, there's a lot of planning and we want to be a great partner for rag ride. So we've had a lot of uh, community leaders get back to us and ask us if we can, uh, uh, you know, provide um, everything from facilities and uh, busing and different things. So we're working through that. And Jerry Mitchell's doing a great job of filling lots of requests. We get lots of requests for that and making sure that we can do it legally and reasonably, but we want to be a good partner. 
And finally, a strategic goal, Hedgehog for Healthy Culture. Just want to thank everybody uh, that was part of negotiation to contracts. It was another challenging year, it's always challenging, but we had a productive interest-based bargaining session, so that's why we have uh, for your uh, consideration tonight, approved contracts. So that's the update of the district. Thank you. Board members, anybody have anything? Maybe? Oh, I do. You do? <laughs> I just remembered the art show is at the Art Center. Um, I haven't seen it yet because we were gone, but I'm going to. Looks like there are a lot of, a lot of outstanding pieces of art. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so next we have committee reports, uh, facilities, Director Fox. So we had a facilities meeting last week. Um, Jerry Mitchell is here to speak mostly about what the important parts of that meeting were, um, specifically looking at filling in the pool. And I guess the takeaway for that is we just wanna continue moving forward on that project and seeing it as you know multiple small projects um, to show that we're making forward. And again, Jerry will speak more to that tonight. Thank you. Negotiations, myself. Um, <clears throat> you've seen the agreements with the uh, staff and the certified and, and um, classified staff. Um, so we've had quite a few meetings lately about this, and um, it really went well uh, with the uh, um, classified staff people, I thought, and we got it knocked out. Do you have anything to add? No, I, I mean, it's always challenging, but you know, yeah. I thought we at the end, it's about the product and about that we come to win-win conclusions, but uh, we also figured there's more places we can grow in the interest-based bargaining process, but I really want to give a shout out to the support staff. It, you know, it's, it's been hard at times, and they've really grown the most, I think, in embracing the process, and you know, win-win bargaining is always, uh, I think, best for all people. Okay. And policy committee, Josh, you want me to take that? Yeah, so uh, first thing, Pat and I had a policy committee and I was running way late. She completed it all in 20 minutes. So thanks, Pat, for that. We were very efficient that night. Yeah, actually, that was it, was, it was Bethany Bjorkman that did it that quickly. Um, what we discussed at that meeting was the um, stock epinephrine um, policy that we're going to talk about next. So I'm, we recommend that that be approved. Um, so um, we'll move on to number seven. Um, the stock epinephrine, if I'm probably not saying that right, auto injector supply policy first reading. Has everybody read the policy? Bethany, you can come up and talk about it if you want to. Well, hello. Well, hello. I am Bethany Bjorklund. I am one of the two school nurses for Charles City Community Schools. Um, my colleague Jessica Moore and I uh, drafted together an epi stock epinephrine policy for our school district. Um, there's just some fun little quick facts about stock epinephrine. Um, it is a medication that can be quite expensive for our families. And so we want to be more equitable for our students and their families. Um, another interesting statistic about um, epinephrine, it's the only medication available to reverse severe um, anaphylaxis or an allergic reaction. I am a mother actually of a child who used to be allergic to peanuts and eggs. And I was absolutely terrified and mortified all the time that she would have accidental exposures to something. Even though I am a nurse, I am prepared, I read every label. Sometimes still things happen. And uh, we wanna make sure we're here to advocate for our children, our staff, these epinephrine pens would also be available um, to anybody. Um, obviously, we will only train pertinent staff uh, by the nurses. We will follow Department of Education's requirements in that training. We'll make sure our staff understand um, what anaphylaxis looks like and how quickly it is and how to give it safely. Another added bonus for our school district is Myelin, the company that makes epinephrine pens, uh, the EpiPen brand name. Um, provides that um, auto injector free for schools that applies. There's no cost for our school district, um, which two of those pens can cost $600, which is very expensive. And uh, we just wanna make sure that 
if in that event they can't afford it at that time, insurance and things like that, we want to make sure it's accessible. Uh, we hope and pray we never ever have to give it, but at least we know it's here and we're ready to go. Um, the other thing is 24% of epinephrine administration in schools occur in people we don't know what they're allergic to. And so we want to make sure that we're ready in times like that as well. And something like that actually kind of happened to me at one of the schools last week. And so she was okay, but it's very scary. So we just want to be ready. Well, you have uh, some at each site then? Yes. We are required through Myland to have the 0.15 and the 0.3 dose and then have the weight on it for us to help us out with that yes is it uh reverse like every allergic reaction so like hives and stuff like that it may but it may only be temporary, temporary yeah. and they, they go to the er after they got the injection it's uh for true uh, sensitivity allergic reaction anaphylaxis yes it does so oh, open up the airway this time right, right, mm -hmm. right, right. awesome yeah really get it in soon to be you don't want to it's time dependent on it. So you mm -hmm. want to think about it. Not want to go. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And I think that's something too that we want to make sure we really train our staff um, to understand what that is and go with your gut and go with it. And yes, of course, anytime we give that, we will be calling 911. Mm -hmm. So is there a negative impact if you give it to somebody? It doesn't hurt them. No, that it, it can only help. It, it's exceedingly rare to, to help. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just I'm <laughs> curious if somebody's like, sure, right. give them the shot. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. And if you look at the last yeah. paragraph of that in Iowa code, um, if we act in good faith, which yeah. of course we will. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Any other questions? This needs a motion then. Is that right? Yes, it does. Yes. It does. The, to approve the stock epinephrine auto injector supply policy first reading as presented, I'll make that motion. I'll second. Been moved and seconded to approve the stock epinephrine auto injector supply policy first reading as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say, say no. Okay, it's approved. First reading five zero. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. thanks for being proactive. David, thanks for answering our questions. Yeah, no, we appreciate that. And thanks for getting it for free. Though. Yeah, it'll, it'll sit there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. This is all about that. <laughs> it's not everybody. You know. Thank you. Okay, number eight, pool discussion. Jerry. Welcome. Um, thanks for having me tonight. Uh, we sort of started this discussion a little bit at our facilities committee. And what we're really looking at doing is coming to you guys now to see if you want to keep proceeding with this with this uh, project as work we start. So what we're looking at doing is I got sort of an estimate and when I originally did this, and I think it was a few months ago, I just threw a number out there because I really didn't know and it was really high. I think I put like 400,000 on it. So I got a pretty concrete number now from a contractor uh, to fill in the pool. Um, and to do that, you have to go down, plug the drain, plug the water lines. I called the DNR already if there's anything specific. And I said, we've never had anybody call to close down a school pool before. Let me look and find out. So they called me back and said, as long as we do all that, we're just fine. Um, uh, so you have to bust off that lip. There's about a two-inch lip that goes all the way around that pool. Bust that off, have it down in the pool, fill the pool with sand, uh, get a compaction uh, person in there to make sure it's compacted enough so when we pour cement over top, it doesn't crack, break, and all that. Uh, they pour a two-inch layer then over the whole thing, so it'd be one level surface. Uh, the other thing that we have to do to do this project is put that 14 by 14 over to do it. So uh, to do that, we got to get a structural engineer just to make sure we have that supported enough above that because that's going to support a big section of that east wall. So um, combination, the, the, to fill the pool is approximately around 130,000. To put the 14 by 14 over to do it, will be right around 40,000. And it'll be two separate projects, but you have to do them both together to do it because it would be two different contractors. The contractor fills in the pool can't do the door work because they're not especially in that. Um, the reason I'm bringing it to you to see if we want to keep proceeding with this is because that could provide so many different things. Right now, if you go there and look at it, it we've got a bunch of storage in there. We've got it down in the pool. We've got it around the pool. We're drawing with items right now. Uh, now you're wondering, where's drama going to go if we fill that in and use it for something else? With removing all those air handlers in the last update I sent to everyone, 
There's two huge rooms up on a, a level with a, a wrestling room now where old air handlers come out. That is probably about as much as what's down in the pool. So we have the lift. So if it's something bigger that needs to go up there, we can lift it up into the, the wrestling room and all that. So we actually created some really nice storage rooms up there. Plus, they'll still have some storage down below on the first level also. Um, doing that, you could use that for a multi-purpose room. You could you could use it for a big gathering. You could use it for a gym. You could use it for a small auditorium. There's so many different options you can use it for, and we always need space in the school. We, we're actually, with losing North Grand to where, where we're at now with it, I run out of places to store stuff. So now we're trying to figure out what we're going to do. So that's why we're building like a second level of the new maintenance facility. So we have some storage up high and it's created a, a great place to store stuff. Um, one thing that also is a positive, there is one seven and a half ton heating and cooling system that is being installed on the pool with the, the project that was approved a while ago that they're working on now. That's enough to heat and cool that room with very minimal people in. If we want to use that for a larger gathering, what we did is they were going to take out all the old ductwork out of the old air handler that was run from the boiler system, which was a steam unit. We left the ductwork in place, capped it at the roof. So if we want to use it for a larger gathering space, all we have to do is drop a, a natural gas um, unit right on top of that ductwork. So all we got is a cost of installing that, running the natural gas to it, and off we go, we're ready to go because all the ductwork's there in place. So we did some proactive things that were supposed to be taken out. A uh, local contractor that got the plumbing and heating and cooling for that project. We talked about it. I worked with him for many, many years, and we pretty much know each other what we're going to do in the future. So let's leave that. It was a great idea. So it's great network. It's still in good condition. So we've got some positive things moving forward also. Um, so really, that's sort of my spiel tonight. And uh, I've got questions. Yeah, just, go ahead. Just the floor part. You're going to pour concrete over that. So the, the whole floor is going to be concrete. If you use it for any purpose other than storage, you're going to have to ever put a different flooring on it correct um i've looked in some different options so um you need a two by two snap together rubber floor that you put in and you can take down and up if you want to for different events uh we could put um a poor a poor rubber floor in there that could be used for anything there's many options what we want to do with this project is just get it to that point, that point. and then at that point we can decide what do we want to do for with it from here do we want to make it so it's a small auditorium do we want to make it a gym do we want to make it a gathering space then you have a lot of options where you can come and do other okay. things. So you're at about just a little shy of two hundred thousand yeah. for this. Yeah, uh, total price would be uh, one, about one seventy five. One seventy five. Yep. So, what kind of money are you looking at for making it into something else? We haven't really looked. I know there was a presentation put to uh, some of us in, from the uh, fine arts department. And they had some different costs and they had some things were very extravagant and they had some things that were scaled back. So it could be anywhere from 50,000 to make it sort of a small auditorium to 500,000. It depends on how extravagant you want to go. Mm -hmm. If you make it so it's something that can be portable, so you want to use it for a small auditorium and run some small productions in there. And then the next day we want to use it for a second gym, make it so it can be pushed off to the side. The basketball hoops on the end make them portable, like uh, what you see at the Baker College, you know, venues where they can roll them and all that. We do things like that. So the cost to make it to what we want to from there, we haven't really looked to finalize them, Dr. Schroep, but um, yeah, there'd be something. But the nice thing about that is it goes on to the different groups that want to use it. So if fine arts want to do it, maybe they'll help us get a little money to do it. Athletics want to do it. They can go to the booster club. They've got a lot of different things that they raise money for. They can help do that. So there's, we're just giving it an option for many different things in the district. Jerry, could could you do that floor finish that you talked about in this building to make absolutely. it a nice yes, smooth absolutely. finish? Yes, absolutely. And then it look like a marble floor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't know if many of you went up and saw right outside of the uh, fifth grade studio, the floor that we did up there, and then when they took the consent, but that's what it looked like. Or if you went out to the fairgrounds, we did that one too, the, um, the enrichment center, that's done that. It's a polished concrete. It's a very easy process, and it makes it look like a marble floor. It looks beautiful. So that's, and it's so easy to maintain. 
So that's the access. So we want to do to do that in that uh, room that size would probably be about three thousand dollars is all. So it's not bad. So the first thing you have to do is get the door though, because you can't do any of that other stuff to okay. that would be the first thing you have to do. Yep. Yep. And a company that will get the bid, they're gonna hire the engineer to get the structural support. I just want it to turn the key that they do it. I don't want to have to hire an engineer to work with them. So if we do this and if I get the approval from you guys to proceed to get some bids, and you can always reject the bids. If I get the approval tonight to go out and get bids, I'll go out and get a couple three bids and just and discussion. It's just discussion tonight. What's that? It's just discussion. Just discussion tonight. Yeah. Yeah. So, We'd have to come back with that in the future. Right. So. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. How, how would we ensure that you know if we put the money in to make the floor that we would actually use the space? Because we have lots of spaces that don't get used to their full potential, right? Um, for big gathering spaces, yeah. they get used a lot. So let me put a couple of examples. Like a new volleyball. A lot of times they'll use the high school gym and the middle school gym. And then we've got the whole school that they got to go between. Mm -hmm. This one would be the hallway between them on the south side of the building that you can go between the two. That could be a venue or bigger things like that. Um, basketball tournaments go there. Uh, we got um, different uh, fine arts, uh, the district contests and things like that. We've got those two big facilities right there that could be together right now to make it happen up here. They're so far apart in the gyms, and then we're going throughout the whole the whole school. So it would be a really, rehearsal space too. Right. You know, there's there's so many different options to have when you have large spaces. So um, now underutilizing things, maybe the things that in the district maybe are a little underutilized are the elementary um, gymnasiums. Those probably don't get used as much as the rest, but this year they've actually been used quite a bit. So it, it's, we've got a, what's called a facilities calendar that people can reserve spaces and so forth, either from the community or within the school. And uh, our department runs that. And it's it's crazy how much the school districts get used by outside organizations. And that kind of goes to the next point: is we are a public school and we want to be part of the public. Mm -hmm. And so creating spaces and welcoming the community in. Is a sharing agreement with our yeah, community plus that we're just having a hole in the ground that's doing that. Yeah, correct. <laughs> that's kind of the bigger picture. Yeah. 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 Costumes in there, it's really an unusual space, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, it's not handy. And then it's about uh, the parking lot. Who's responsible for the parking lot over there? Yeah, the parking lot. Um, at the first five years, if we if it sort of goes with what's going on right now, our projection is we'll own it for five years. At the five years, and it switches over to TLC. It's our responsibility that for, for now until we decide if it's going to switch over or not, or for the state of school district. So it will be our responsibility. Okay. Which so is fine. Five, 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 five doesn't, doesn't have the parking lot. He has the north one. Well, that's the one by the voting dock. Right. So okay. Mr. Fouch will own the north parking lot <laughs> and everything from there to the front of the old 30 edition. Uh, the school owns everything from that north parking lot around the east parking lot and then back to the south entrance which the south entrance is where you know if anyone else grew up in Charles city when you go out and sit on those cement platforms and wait for your parents because we have no such thing as cell phones or anything else and you sit there for an hour sometimes because they wouldn't come so we went through them right there so that's jerry this is off the subject a little bit but are there any lights in that parking lot yes um what had happened and uh we we put all new not all new Three quarter LED now lights that are. I was thinking the last time I was there in the dark, it was very dark. Early in the, early in the school year, okay. um, we had one working and one going on and off. So we ordered LED and it took about four months to get them. Okay, so that's what the hold up work has been. We did hire that done and we have those. So Sorry, our, to bring my flashlight. Lights. Okay. Right now it's about three quarter full of construction equipment. Yeah. Okay, okay. good. So, All right, thanks, Jerry. Appreciate it. So, the you. next meeting, will we decide? Well, we'll, we'll talk about we'll it. Talk about okay. It. okay. All right. Thank thanks, you. Jerry. Thank you. Okay, Charles City Center for Advanced Professional Studies. Otherwise known as CAPS. You can just hold it too, Tam, if you want. Oh. It's broken, sorry. Oh. <laughs> it's All right, um, my name is Tammy Wheeler, and I am one of the new business teachers here at Charles City. 
and I'm here to talk about a program program called CAPS. Go ahead. Um, so the question that I always like to um, think about is how can we help our students develop skills that the traditional classroom experience doesn't address? And so go ahead and click the next slide. Um, and so CAPS is, is the answer to that, in my opinion. Um, like we said, it's the Center for Advanced Professional Studies. And CAPS is basically just a collaboration between businesses, the community, and um, education in the school. Um, and it provides professional um, experiences for students. So essentially what we do is we take high school students right out of the classroom and immerse them into real life um, projects and things that they can work on with businesses or other organizations in the Charles City area. And so we really just try to kind of create a, a way to help students kind of prepare kind of for their purpose. Um, the four cornerstones that we kind of teach and, and kind of go off from are innovation, problem solving, um, career exploration, and professional skills. Um, and we really try to just kind of, again, like talk about like students' pathway to purpose. Like we try to figure out like, what are you passionate about? What are your talents? Uh, what are you good at? Because sometimes those are the things that we just need to hone in on. Um, one thing I like to really stress about CAPS is it is not an on-the-job training experience. It's not going to a business filing papers. That's not what it is. It's going to a business that's actually doing real projects for them. So it's more career-oriented. Um, um, one of the things that I like to talk to students about in school when I do talk about CAPS are some of the opportunities that they would have. And the first one is the biggest one is just having that project-based learning because students get to kind of drive their own learning and decide what it is that I'm passionate about and what do I want to learn and what do I want to do. It gives them new opportunities, even real world experiences. Um, I love the networking part because they're networking with adults in the community, um, business adults, professionals. Um, and it just, like, again, it just kind of drives their passion. I've been out in the last couple of months having conversations with local businesses. And one of the things I really like to talk to them because about is because sometimes as, um, you know, school personnel, like we go to a business and they just think we're there for a handout. Like we want something from you. And I like to just really, you know, talk about like, we're not here for a handout, we're here for a handshake and we want to partner with you. Um, and so what I've been doing with local businesses is just talking to them and bringing awareness to them about what is CAPS, because a lot of people haven't heard of that before. Um, and then a couple of things that um, we want businesses to, to do is jump on board with us, because with our business projects, we don't have anything for our student associates to do. So I've been um, going around and I'll like take this notebook with me and um, if we talk about, you know, like, what are some like maybe 10 different um, projects that you just seem to not be able to get done? And so, you know, they can list off, you know, well, we can get through these six or seven, but when they get to the bottom, this eight, nine, 10, and they just can't seem to ever get there because they're so busy, that's kind of that sweet spot for our student associates. And they can then engage with those um, clients or our business people. And so what does that look like for businesses and organizations? It would be if a student would decide to pick up a project from that business, that business then would kind of be their client and they would learn how to have discovery meetings and, and you know, walk through. I would, you know, teach students how to do that. Um, but that's kind of my main focus is when I go see businesses is just really talk to them about like, what are some projects that maybe you could have for our students. Um, so in the fall, we went to, I took about eight or nine students and Pat went with us and we went to Cedar Falls in Denver. Um, I, background, I, I did um, a CAPS program in the school that I was at the last two years. And so I just, I'm very passionate about the program because it just, it's, it's really good for students. And so anyway, in the fall, I took about eight or nine students and we went to a couple of Cedar Valley CAPS programs just to kind of see that in action so that students could see that. And Claire was somebody that came with, and so she's gonna kind of talk about some of those questions. All right, so what we saw, so when we went to the Cedar Falls one first, and they met actually at UNI, so they're on 
the campus and they showed up in the morning and they're all like dressed professionally. And so they like sat in their groups and they were talking about their projects. And then we actually picked the day that they got a little lecture about deadlines. <laughs> but so we went there and it was cool just to see like the different projects that they were working on and like that, that they picked and that they were passionate about. There was one they were doing, was it like the, when Santa came to town, like the host event for that. Um, There's like a mural in one of the schools and just different stuff that they're interested in. And then for me, what I'm excited for is just to like get out of the classroom and get like the business experience, be able to dress professionally every day and just be able to network with people and just get my face out in the community and make connections. Okay, pretty good. Yeah, great. Um, so I guess I'll open it up to questions. That was that was quick. I mean, if I actually really wanted to talk about apps, I would talk probably an hour. What businesses did you go to? Oh gosh. Was it here local? Yes, yes, all local businesses okay. in General City. Yeah, I have a list in my room of all the okay. businesses. Big, little. Yep. Different yep. sizes. All of that. Okay. Yeah. And they, they are receptive? Yes, there was not one business. I probably have a list of about 10, 12 mm -hmm. businesses that I've gone to, and there was not one business that said, this is a really dumb idea. Why are we doing that? <laughs> <laughs> like, they were all very, very receptive. And actually, uh, I spoke at the Lunch and Learn um, that Justin set up. So I was there, and I had multiple businesses that I had already spoke to approach me and say, when are you going to send out that print request for? And I'm like, no, oh, we're not really ready for that yet. But yeah, so I have not it, had one does business. It, does it take uh, approving this uh, motion then to get started, or are students mm -hmm. already doing things? Or uh, I would be ho hoping that we could start this in the fall. Oh, all yeah. Right. So I'm right. still out right. kind of talking to businesses. Um, so it, it takes a little front loading to get sure. going. Yeah, sure. you can't yeah. just yeah right. start without mm -hmm. having a little. So I'm still, yeah, I have a meeting tomorrow and I have another meeting Wednesday. And so what, what uh, grade levels would be involved? Uh, for right now, we're thinking junior seniors. This is probably more of an upper level. Sure. You know, I kind of like to look at it as more like an AP mm -hmm. class, you know, um, and we just decided, you know, sophomores by instructor approval. You know, so so yeah. yeah. How would you decide uh, which students are eligible and which uh, businesses they would match up with? That would be up to the student and what projects would be out there. So I would have, um, uh, I, I've learned how to use like, like a Trello board. And so um, I would just put like all the businesses names up there and whatever projects they would have. And that board then would be pushed out to students and they could look at the board and they get to decide, okay. you know, and that's, that's really the, the, that's the cool part of it is, you know, they get to decide their learning and they get to push that with my guidance, but yeah. How will you then uh, ensure that, you know, the learning that the business said, this is what we're gonna do and the outcomes for the students match up? Yeah, so um, we, so the way I like to kind of evaluate the CAPS program is I do like three evaluations throughout the semester. So I evaluate at six weeks, 12 weeks and a final. And a lot of it is what Claire kind of hit on deadlines, you know, just, just like we have to meet in our jobs, you know, did you reach that deadline? Um, and then the four cornerstones too, you know, the innovation, the problem solving, professional skills, career exploration. Um, so there's different categories that I have. So I have like these five standards that I kind of match up. Does that answer your question? Would the students write any at the end to you? Presentation, Presentation or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> um, what um, what we've done in the past at the school I was at, um, all of the CAPS, um, the Cedar Valley CAPS groups all got together at the end of the um, semester. Um, and then they had a big innovation celebration where kids then would showcase all their project, you know, their project that they did. Um, I also went a step further and I did, a th I did something called a demo day where like a, maybe a month before the big innovation celebration, I would just have our own little Charles City demo day where we would invite school board members, teachers, parents, 
our businesses that partnered with us and they would just have this big open house where they could just you know set up their project and demo that to anybody that would want to come and so and that was actually a little project that we did that you know that that became a project like how are we going to do this are we going to water are we got cupcakes are we going to have food what are we going to do you know so we just created it as like a this is like a little mini project that we can all work on and then we invited all these people to come to our demo day so it's kind of like a science fair and i'm kind of generalizing there because it's not science but it's where they take their project and they showcase what they've done and they bring it to kind of talk about it for sure okay so is this entirely during the school day? Yes. Yep. It would be three periods of day of the day. So probably period six, seven, and eight, right at the end of the day, probably. So they have to figure that out how they're gonna they're continue to be in things. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. So extracurricular activities could affect could be affected. Well they come back for that. Unless they get a job and I can pay, right? Well, there, this what, is a uh, learning, this isn't a paid thing. The, if it takes, you said three periods in a, in a day. Uh -huh. So, what would that, as far as the graduation requirements, what would it fulfill as far as the graduation elective. requirements? Well, it's just elective. Elective. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's yeah. all I wonder. That's yeah. what I was going to say, but I was like, hopefully that's the right answer. <laughs> yep. Electives. But I just think it's neat that you've done this before, and so you yeah. have some familiarity and comfort yeah. with it, and excited to implement it here at Trust City. So I'm super just, excited. Yeah. Can somebody explain what the advantage will be of signing this agreement of of going with the Cedar Valley? That was one of the questions I had. Is there like some type of certification that happens with it, or do we get some curriculum, or do we get some leadership training, or whatever? Exactly what you said. They're, we're kind of in a unique spot. We're not in the Cedar Valley by their means. Um, and we're very fortunate for Tammy. Um, just so you know, I think she kicked me every day until I found <laughs> um, So we appreciate that. But it's definitely the vision and the, for a vision where we're going, trying to go to school. Um, and so where this agreement kind of came apart is she had some connections down in the Cedar Valley. And it's very tough to start this from ground zero, right? Starting at nothing. And so by coming into this agreement, kind of our intention and our long-term plan is we're going to use this agreement for two years, just kind of as resources to get started. Um, they provide us a lot of the stuff. They give us a lot of coaching. They give us a lot of professional developments on what this should look like, um, as well as kind of a partnership, because otherwise this is always the challenge. Whenever you start a new program, she would be alone. And being alone is very hard to make your own program go. Our kind of long-term goal is that in two years, we kind of reevaluate where we are. We kind of talk that we have the goal of we would actually start and become our own hub in two years where we can maybe reach out to some local districts. And then we're actually kind of in the opposite spot where we would be starting our own Charles City Caps as the Iowa Network. So we would be our own version of this, the Cedar Valley Caps, and then we can actually look out for our own partnerships in the future. So it kind of goes into we kind of get the resources now, get the assistance now, and then we start to shift because going into like, we have a regional academy coming, you know, there's already going to be some sharing and some partnerships. Let's jump on that with CAPS in a couple of years where, hey, we could be looking at 2080 agreement between us and RMR, us and, us and OSAGE, or us and anybody around us. Because I know we kind of played with that a little bit before. This kind of gives us a new lens that really adjusts to that career side. It's kind of a big difference that I've seen in this program. Brian, for those of us who've been around for a while, when we did the Iowa Big North, how does this compare to that program? What, what do we see as the differences, the benefits, that kind of thing? It is, I mean, point blank, it's very similar. Okay. Um, the probably biggest shift I've seen knowing both programs, the first time she talked about it, I was like, oh, this is a lot like Iowa Big. So I'm not <laughs> much about it. I was like, all right, here's Iowa Big. This is the biggest difference in career focus. That's a huge part of this program. That's one of the cornerstones, really trying to get and prepare for that career edge or those career skills. Um, versus Iowa Big was a little bit more, they had the problem solving, they had the projects, but this is a little bit more that kind of half point of like, hey, let's get them in a career focused area. Let's get them doing career specific skills. So we see this as kind of the, the next step. Correct. Okay. Yep. yep. Thanks. What, one of the things that I saw that day that we went, when we not, went down to Cedar House, the, the group of students that was doing the Santa Claus house or whatever it was, they needed help. And so all the rest of the students that were in the CAPS program said, okay, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? What do I need to do? And so then it became a large group um, execution of the project. You know, the other guys have done the ground floor work, but 
though that collaboration I thought was great. And they were all volunteering like crazy. So and the mural I think was wasn't it a history wall on their new high school mm -hmm. with Envision, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're actually working with the architects of the yeah, yeah, yeah. Of the school. Okay. That's, yeah. Anybody else have any questions for any of us? There's a possibility also that they could have two smaller projects, right? If one yeah. needed to be done earlier, well, they could tag into another one. Like, you know, you could take a three-week project. Oh, yeah, stuff. yeah. So, I mean, some of the projects that businesses might put on the project board or that I would put on there from them could be just a two-week little project that maybe they just need some help, you know, planning, I don't know, something in the park for Christmas or, you know, I don't know. Um, but then some of them could be, you know, a whole semester. Um, you know, I, I mean, one project I like to really highlight and talk about uh, that a student of, of mine did in, at Columbus, and she was only a sophomore, so, which was pretty cool right there, is, um, so the transit buses that we have here in Charles City, the white buses, with blue, like, mm -hmm. transit, whatever. <laughs> Um, in the Cedar Valley, they also had those, only the business that I talked to, that was one of their projects. They wanted to rebrand these buses because they were just very boring. Do you have that? Oh, I thought you were oh no, I was like, my, I was like yeah. no. Um, and so um, this girl took this project on as a sophomore, and um, she literally rebranded um, the entire busing system in the Cedar Valley. And it represented like eight or nine counties. So now I drive around and I see these buses that say on board with the cool arrows and the new colors and like, you know, we, you know, a student did that. And I just think I don't take any of the credit for that because she did it. You know, I could train her up to how to, how, how to have a discovery meeting with a client and I could train her up, you know, how to do some of those things, but it was all her and I like to give students all the recognition that they deserve because they're the ones doing the work and and it's so cool to see that because she was as a sophomore so proud that you know she did this and I was yeah you're <laughs> awesome you know and, and she did so it's, it's cool stuff just to see how students I love to see CAP students come in and in the beginning of the semester and they're all quiet and shy they don't want to say anything you know they don't want to like get out of their comfort zone and by the end it's like you can hardly settle them down because they just want to do more they want to do more and more and so just the growth that that i see in that even just versus even just like being in a classroom i mean it's just so different like i just really try to keep it very very different it's not a classroom like you are literally working for a business so okay Question more questions or is there a motion? I'd make a motion to approve the 2080 agreement for Charles City Center for Advanced Professional Studies as presented. Second. Is there a second? Second. Oh, sorry. Yep. Didn't hear you. It's been moved and seconded to approve the 2080 for the Charles City Center for Advanced Professional Studies as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign or say no. Okay, it's approved. Five zero. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Tammy. Thanks, Claire. Yeah. No, it's fine. My computer was just like falling. Oh, no, it was just like tripping over. I thought it was dying. No, <laughs> it turned into a bigger thing. Than <laughs> okay. Um, number 10, Charles City Community Education Association Master Contract. Initial. So we got to our. Uh, Got to a consensus on where we need to be at Venture Space Bargain. So we did our initials and our calendars the other day. And uh, so we're excited. This is one of the more robust um, raises we want to do because we've had so many health insurance increases. So it's been nice that uh, we're able to put quite a bit more money on the base and do step lane. And so um, the TSS at, at the end, uh, sometimes there, it ends up the place where there's a TSS balance. We have to reconcile that. If you have questions, we can explain that more with uh, with Evan as well. But this. Um, which would allow us to go ahead and proceed. Uh, I believe it's been ratified by the union, correct? That's correct. And so after this, uh, pending your approval, we can start the issue contract. So any questions you might have about the association? TFS here? stands for Teacher Supplemental Salary. Yes, right. that is correct. That's part of state uh, aid that we get that's built into the funding formula. Thank you. So it goes directly to salary. 
two questions. One is, you know, the, the total dollars that we see for an increase for FY23, um, will they be within the amount that we have allocated here as well as the insurance costs? So we're not going to spend more essentially than we're getting. Uh, so what's happening is, as, as you might know, we have a 2.5 increase from the state, right? And the 3.0 is obviously more than that. What the issue is, or the positive issue is, we have so much federal funding booing us right now that we're seeing our unspent balance go up, and it, it just doesn't seem fair that our unspent balance goes up and we're not using that to contribute to uh, the teacher uh, salaries and the support staff salaries, especially in inflation, it's in somewhere between six to seven percent. Um, because that was one-time money, and so obviously spending down some one-time money, but. Uh, both uh, Evan and I calculated on kind of you know figured that out how much one time money we'd be spending it was within our allowable limits that it wouldn't get us into a financial cliff is the biggest piece. But it's hard to be able to look at the staff and go, oh my well, gosh, you know, we're only gonna do two point five when we obviously see our bank account increasing. Sounds like you guys thought about it and have a plan, which is really good. Yes. Yeah. And then the other one is um, so the governor has a specific and I'm gonna call it a stipend now. I think that's the term that she used of a thousand retention of a thousand dollars. How does that work into this package? Separate. It's really totally separate. separate. Okay. It's totally separate. So, so that nothing to do with that thousand dollars is not included in this percentage. So okay. that is a one-time retention bonus that was uh, completely separate. Okay. Okay. Great. I'll make a motion to approve the three-year master contract that includes the teacher step and lane advancement, and increase the regular program base by seven hundred and twenty-two dollars for a total package increase of three percent and allowing the district to reconcile the teacher supplemental salary if needed to comply with all laws and regulations. Second. When moved and seconded to approve the three-year master contract that includes the teacher step and lane advancement and increase the regular program base by $722 for a total package increase of 3% and allowing the district to reconcile the teacher supplemental salary if needed to comply with laws and regulations. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Five zero. It's approved. And the clarification is it is a one year contract on uh, salary and benefits, and then for uh, it's a master contract, the language is a three year contract. Yes. Okay, next, Charles City Community Educational Services Association Master Contract. This is the support staff. Yep, this is where I classified staff. So, as you can see, what we have here, the difference with this is a uh, five year for a uh, five year agreement for the language. And it's a three year agreement for the salary. So it, uh, you'll see it's a dollar an hour. The next year be 50 cents, the next year after that 50 cents. If we can do more than 50 cents in the next year, we'll do that. But you know, we just have a nice financial forecasting. Um, it's a pretty robust raise. We, we've had nickels and 30 cents here and there. And we have to be competitive with other employers in the community. And we wanted to do that best we could. So that's why my recommendation was to do a dollar. And uh, so you can see what that is, and we're very, uh, very pleased that we worked this out with the uh, with the association, and think this is uh, hopefully what we like to call more a fair. This was approved by them also. Yes, it was ratified as, as well. So as soon as this is uh, approved by the board, we can refer it again issuing contracts. I'll make a motion to approve the five-year <laughs> master contract that includes a one dollar an hour increase for the 2022-23 school year. A 50 cent an hour increase for the 23 24 school year and a 50 cent increase an hour for the 2024 that's 325 school year. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the five year master contract that includes a dollar an hour increase for the 2022 23 school year, a 50 cent an hour increase for the 23-24 school year and a 50 cent an hour increase for the 24-25 school year. So any more discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Uh, it passes 5-0. Okay. I don't get carpal tunnel now. Okay, health insurance. So we're looking at a change in our health insurance, and this is where it gets really geeky, but at the end of the day, this is what's best for us financially. It also allows us to keep the same benefits and plan design for our staff with it just a small changes. Uh, we, we really, again, the district doesn't have to actually, we are not legally obligated to have to um, 
Um, Barbara, I will work with uh, anybody at this. It's purely the discretion of the district of health insurance, but we do in our interest based bargaining uh, have conversations about this. And we appreciate we had some family design changes last year. Uh, health insurance just continues to skyrocket in the, in the cost. And so uh, some of the things we've looked at is, what is a, we're going to a partially self funded. We've been fully self funded and we're just not big enough anymore to more to really support that. We're running about 350 employees, we're at 250 in that range. So a um, partially self-funded makes much more sense. And so this would allow us to uh, be much more financially solvent because as you see in the financials, we keep seeing a decrease in the, um, in the, the balance of that uh, self-funded um, self uh, account. So uh, if any questions you have for clarity for this, Evan and I can answer that. We've been working with Group Benefit Partner, which is our third party consultant that helps us well as analysis of this. So this has been uh, uh, lots and lots of uh, debate and lots of um, uh, looking at the facts and figures. Was there any conversation? I assume there's a health insurance committee or something that included the staff from all categories? Just the negotiations. Oh, yeah, yeah, negotiations we talked about it. And, yeah, okay. and they, uh, they are the ones who <clears throat> Evan had initially pro, uh, um, proposed that uh, to, for it to all stay the same yeah. with the ten dollar copay, mm -hmm. and they were the ones that brought up they wanted to go with the twenty five dollar copay because they want to keep that partially self insured health fund soluble. Okay, sounds great. So. And uh, they also agreed that the better prescription plan was a good thing. So right. yeah, absolutely. This was this was not done in isolation. It was absolutely done as a consensus through the interest based bargaining. And again, it's never fun. We we just did all this work uh, with uh, uh, Brian Jones actually led a team last year. We did, did a lot of work on this. And like, oh, hopefully we put this to bed. But uh, with COVID and just you know skyrocketing um, cost, it just keeps getting more and more difficult. So. Uh, well, I was really happy that we were able to get a consensus on this. Never fun enough to do this, but we did find a win-win. Yeah, I thought it went pretty well. Yeah, really well. Both groups mm -hmm. great, so. And they agreed with each other, which was huge. Yeah. Is there a motion? I make a motion to approve the Charles City Community School District to move to a fully insured health plan with Walmart, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and implement a partially self-funded plan with Midwest Group Benefits for the July 1st, 2020 renewal. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve the Charles City Community School District to move to a fully insured health plan with Walmart Blue Cross Blue Shield and implement a partially self funded plan with Midwest Group benefits for the July 1st, 2022 renewal. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. 5 0. Substitute pay discussion. We continue to get uh, feedback from some of our current substitutes, both paraeducators and teachers, about some continued uh, increases in bonuses or pay. But obviously, we had a task force convene on this last fall, made some pretty big changes, and we went up to 125 uh, daily and did the $500 30 day bonuses. But obviously, we want to make sure that all of our people are feeling heard. So I just want to throw out that we you know, have a discussion item about the one that would be. Uh, you know, increase in parasite pay, any other things that we might want to attach to teachers. Uh, we have been seeing the teacher uh, sub pool has been much better, you know, recently. So we, you know, I haven't had a sub recently, so that's a good sign. If I don't have a sub, but not that it's perfect, but we are, um, you see, it seems to be a better, better pool right now. And again, it, there's, there's a cost benefit for all of it, but just want to open a discussion of, and I know Pat can share, she's had some feedback from a few people as well, but want to make sure they're feeling heard and uh, have a discussion about substitute bonus pay. You want to explain? Well, I I had some feedback from some of the para subs that they were feeling less than appreciated because the regular the teacher substitutes were getting these thirty day increment bonus pay and the paras were not. And I thought I explained to them that it was hourly versus, um, but. Do you want to talk more about what that role is? Yeah, so I worked with the legal counsel a little bit to figure out a way to possibly get a $500 bonus for paraeducators who are substituting in the classroom. So one of the things we could discuss or I could bring forward is we can move them instead of doing the para hourly pay, we could get the teacher pay and then they could fall within the group to receive the bonus that they serve. Or the teacher pay window, not the parasub pay window, which requires different different licensures and different requirements. 
So we'd have to check those. So it's a more option. Um, the other concern I've brought to my attention as well is with the shortage of bus drivers that Star Activity is picking up. Because a lot of bus drivers have felt they've had to sub more this year, and they also want to include in the bonus. And there's several bus drivers out there that have been asking about the bonus pay as well, but I'm checking with legal counsel with. So I would recommend um, in the future, like possibly paying them out. Again, a proposal once it's approved by legal counsel, but I want to your guys' thoughts or if you're hearing any concerns or anything like that. So if I'm hearing you right, um, they wouldn't get the $125 that a teacher gets per day, but it would we would come up with a daily pay for a paraeducator. We would have to discuss that okay. and further. Um, Is that what you're um, suggesting though? I'm waiting on, I'm, what I'm suggesting is see what the legal guidance says on the realms and then further do this discussion down the road what the legal guidance says on what the pay window could be to possibly include the bonus. The big piece is this, that there's there's all kinds of, you know, we've done these like broad swap bonuses and uh, retention things and different pieces. And there's always like small subgroups of people that may or not, may or may not be covered. So sub bus drivers, pair of substitutes, pairs that are substituting as teachers during the day that work for us. And there's a pay discrepancy there. And so uh, what we're just having a discussion is an appetite for the board for us to do further study and possibly come back with recommendations on this or to say, you know, at this time, we just want to leave everything as is. Just looking for some direction from the board and, and just see, seeing what you're hearing as well if you've got other people bring it up to you. So that kind of goes to the first point you made, Mike, when you said, like, you've heard or noticed that we have more substitutes available to us than we did maybe at the beginning of the mm -hmm. school year. And so this might have been something that given the climate of illnesses and the pandemic, we just had to pull people in every single direction. And now we may not be in that position that we were at the beginning of the school year. Yes, and that's that's kind of where the tension will be. Okay. Um, I don't know that the market, so like you're speaking, the market's really driving the need for this. Sure. Uh, because I mean, we still have, you know, shortages just here and there, but it doesn't, you know, I'm not hearing from the principals, it's still at the same level it was. However, then we have also the, the ethical piece too. Are we, are we being fair? Are we compensating fairly on those pieces? And that, that's the thing that we can also, you know, look at and have more study compared to other districts and different things. But the uh, substitute bonus thing got to be an arms race for a while. The schools would, you see a raise and a raise and a raise. And sometimes that's not a uh, very wise or healthy thing to do for your, your fiscal either. Were they included in, they were not included in the $1,000 bonus, correct? They were not. Not the substitutes. Right. Would we like to maybe <coughs> do an ad hoc committee on this to connect suggestions? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Have an ad hoc committee to work on this with Evan and Mike. Maybe some of the parents. Okay. Nate? Yeah, that's, I, don't that, yeah, I mean, that's fine. I guess this is just a discussion item, but I, I don't know what would be fair. I'm going to have to right. def defer to your guys judgment here, what would be fair. I, yeah, because I guess are we looking at a retroactive fairness of pay? Is that kind of what we're looking at? Like yeah. recognizing yeah. the work that they did in the 2022 or 2021-2022 school years? It would, you know, it's something we could, we could just debate. I'll just say that's been a pattern of practice. When we've done things like this, we usually went retroactive. So that I want to make sure we're following our past precedent in terms of what we're doing. So what were you, did you have a, did you have a, a thought on what would be fair? You know, for us to do fair, we have to do what's called compensatory studies. So what we have to do is we have to reach out to other districts and, and see, you know, what the market is. We have to see what are our, our rates of getting subs and different pieces are. Um, this is a hard thing. Sometimes what somebody feels mm -hmm. might be different than actually what the numbers are saying sure. and, and doing that. But again, this is the, the tension. We, we, yeah, we'd love to pay everybody as much as they think they can get, but we can't necessarily do that because we're, you know, to a steward of taxpayer money. But we also want to make sure that, uh, as you said, Dr. Schroeder, at one point, too, let, let's just get this done. It, it doesn't going to be an issue down in the future. So if this is something that's going to be an issue in the future, maybe it's time we, we make the move now. But just again, I, I really just want to hear if you guys were hearing anything else from people reaching out to you. It doesn't sound like you have. I know Pat has. And uh, so 
Um, yeah, we can, we can definitely start with maybe just doing some sampling with some additional people um, and maybe not an ad hoc, maybe just put it to a compensation benefits standing committee, maybe okay. have them look it over. Yeah, negotiation. Negotiation committee, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think anytime you can bring in comparable research and just research in general on something like this that maybe does sometimes feel emotionally based is going to give us the most sound. Here's a big point that's on here. I love the people that are talking to us. We know that we're listening to them. Exactly. Yeah. It's fair. Again, I know you're like, oh gosh, she doesn't have much information. I don't. Right. But I wanted you to, I wanted those people watching right going, we don't feel heard. We feel like we're not taking this to work. So Pat and I said, let's take it to the board. Right. And so we'll, uh, we'll get more information and come back to you later. Right. And to those listening, we are listening. And this is the way that we want to make sure that you all the decisions and opinions yeah. are. We want to do it legally. And Correct. But we we do appreciate everybody that helps us out in any way and comes forward with their thoughts and concerns. Right. Thank you. Okay, number fifteen. Um, NEIC conference resolution. So as I, I advise the board, you know, uh, several times this was uh, possibly coming. I find New Hampton notified the uh, NEIC executive team. So the Northeast Iowa Conference executive team are the superintendents of all the schools, so the six schools. Uh, New Hampton School Board passed a resolution uh, initiating action that would remove over the shell out from the conference. So what happens after that comes, it goes to the executive team because New Hampton initiated and had to be voted on. Uh, it passed an executive team five to one, the one obviously being over the shell out was a no. Now it's now requires each of the six school districts to go back to our school boards and consider a resolution directing me and the superintendent how to vote this matter. So I'm kind of like the electoral college in a way. So uh, what will what, happen is it's now in front of you with my recommendation. And then after all of our boards meet, which all of our boards are meeting this week, we'll meet back again as an NEIC executive team and then cast our votes based on how the boards have directed us. If passed over the Shellock schools will be removed as of June 30, 2023, and immediate action will begin to invite schools for an expansion of the NEIC. This is the NEIC's uh, attempt at keeping the NEIC intact and uh, possibly expanding it. And so my recommendation is to sustain the resolution to remove waiver of shell out based on our recommendation or community task force uh, two years ago. So again, I'll entertain any questions or discussion that you have about this. Yeah, Mike, I had a couple of uh, questions. The task force, uh, I was not on board at that time. And uh, there's no documentation of their work. And uh, I, I guess I'm, uh, I'm, I feel a little bit empty about that. I wish that there was something that that, uh, that we had that we could make a decision based on. Your, I was on the task force. We had a bunch of community members who right. came and talked. There were a couple of events specifically here on campus that we brought, you know, community mm -hmm. members who've been here, students, parents, mm -hmm. teachers, and get, they gave feedback on, you know, their experience with uh, the Blue Blue Sherlock School District um, and then what transpired, I think it was the summer of 20, is that right? It was June of 20. It was June of 20. Yeah. Yeah. And I think yeah. Scott Bright was out with him too. Yeah. Yeah. And I was there too. So, uh, no, there, the there, well, you sure on the board yet? Yeah. Okay. The, the recommendation was to, to, to either leave, have Waverly Shellback leave, or the, the recommendation to talk. So to answer your question, Barbara, um, there was documentation. What it was done, it was done on large chart paper. That's how the consultant worked. Mm -hmm. And then what we did, we kept all that chart paper, and then we also took pictures of it mm -hmm. to, to have that. Because then the consultant came, the board members that were on there, came actually presented to us that, uh, at a board meeting to have that. Um, the chart paper actually, this is on me, got lost when we moved to offices because I had all this chart paper. And I've been working on a consultant to see if he can find the pictures and stuff. He has them somewhere. Uh, but, you know, all that was on there. And so at the time, the recommendation was one, either we start a new conference or number two, we look to join a different conference. Okay. And at the time, uh, we, we attempted to start a new conference and it just didn't get traction with some of the current members of the NIC conference at the time. And then we have been looking at joining a different conference for several years now. And uh, again, those are, are, are quiet conversations that we have before the public. And I've had conversations with other superintendents about that over the conferences. Uh, but this one actually kind of, came as um, you know unexpected to us that New Hampton has initiated this action. So it actually fulfills the recommendation in a roundabout way of the task force from two years ago. The, uh, the thing that I am concerned about is, is that whether or not 
doing expelling Waverly Shell Rock from our, our conference solves any of the problems that existed. And, and back in, in that summer, there was a particularly egregious event that was poor sportsmanship. And uh, there's been uh, some chronic issues apparently with uh, sportsmanship. Uh, um, NEIC tracked that from 2008. And it, it, at that time, you had a, a very laudable goal of getting the conference to police itself. Whatever came of that? You know, we've been making efforts for that. And actually, I would say things have been better. We are not had any major uh, events, you know, so far, but they have met with Charles City at least. Mm -hmm. um, we also, uh, our senior leadership team, we're very John on the spot of having senior leaders at events and, and doing our best to police these things. So I've been pleased we've had a few small things here and there that we, we've addressed. The bigger issues coming to this is that uh, Oregon left with the conference several years ago and six schools is not sustainable. And no other schools will join the conference where we show up in. And now it could be the sportsmanship, but this is the big piece. When you have uh, New Hampton with like 900 kids and then you have where we show up with 2,300 kids. And if we go to other neighboring school districts, whether it be, and I'm not seeing as a school district we've talked to, but just it, it, as comparison, North Valley, Denver, Independence, different places, they have no a desire to join a district with that big of a disparity. You know, we have 1,500 kids. I think independence would be in the 12 to 1,300 kids range. And well, 15 to 12 to 1,300, okay, that makes sense. But when you're now saying, hey, you're going to go to a conference with the, with the school district to 2,300, there's just nobody interested in doing that. So the big goal is this, and, and we believe in the conversations we've had, if we were to show up, we were to be out of the district at a conference, we could easily probably secure two to three more schools to join the conference and make it more sustainable. Within what distance? Uh, very, and I can't use specific names that that be improper this time, but very, very drivable. I'm saying some things for us might be less than a half an hour, less than 50 miles. The, the schools that have been in touch with us. The Upper Iowa Conference has, as everybody's probably aware, has asked Wakong Crestwood in New Hampton to join that. Yes. And at least Wakong has expressed some interest according to, uh, this is a an article from uh, Cedar Rapids Paper Gazette. And, and if they've expressed an interest, I don't know if the other ones have have an interest, that, that drops us down to four or less. I mean, it's even conceivable it could be us and decor. And if that happens, uh, then we're going to exercise our other options and join other conferences that are, are near us. That the conference I've been looking at as well would be very drivable. But there's no, the conference I've been looking at and having discussions with, there's no farther away than that we're driving walk on right now, so I can say that. Um, that being said, as I came out of the conference meeting, the superintendents were where consensus their, their preference is to keep the NAIC intact. Mm -hmm. So even the three that have been invited said it's pre you know we'll join the upper aisle if we need to for self-preservation. However, we can find a way to keep the NAIC intact. They prefer to do that. There's a lot of um, tradition among some of the schools, and so I, I think that's a piece. Now the risk we're running is if if we're going to expect to down to five, we've got to find two to three schools to, to keep it sustainable. So there's a risk for us in that. But again, superintendents have all been in conversations with one, two, three, four, about five different school districts about possibly joining. And I don't know that all five would, but I think it's very possible to say two to three of them will. And even if one joined, we'd be able to be sustainable with six. And if we had two to join, we're back to seven where we were before Orion left. There's a lot of ifs. There are a lot of ifs. Uh, and the the biggest thing was the the sportsmanship thing, and you feel like the the conference is doing a better job. Police, I, I would say it's better. I don't. I'm not going to say it's where we want it to be. You know, I, I don't know that that's um, you know, and that's what that's too. We have our own sportsmanship things that we'll continue to work on. You know, in house, I don't you know throw stones and not say that we don't have our own issues because we do. Um, you know, but it, it's better. But uh, again, uh, no, it's not perfect, and it's probably not where I expect it to be. We. We as a school district in a, Waverly ranked last in the, their, however they voted for a sportsmanship thing. In the last six years, we were second to last. Yes, so, absolutely. Uh, we, we have some some of our own embarrassing issues. Uh, so if they have if they're policing, they're policing us too. Yes, we and we well we police our own as well, and that's been been challenging. You know, we had some kids in South Level who part of the community service for some of the things that happened. So we 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 do our thing and you know it, it's gonna happen. It just uh, I've had that tough conversation with our own parents. Um 
I will say this, if you vote, if, if this doesn't occur, if the NEIC doesn't remove where they shut off, my hypothesis is the three will leave. The three will leave and we'll be looking for a new conference. If we go ahead and sustain the vote to remove where they shut off, which I'm very confident the other uh, school districts will as well, then it gives us a fighting chance to keep the NEIC alive. Um, and if it fails, we're still looking for a new conference. I, I really don't think there's, I think there's a win-win for us. We'll either end up in a healthier NEIC or we're going to end up in a different conference. I don't think there's a lose-lose for us in this situation. So where will the ERB voted uh, in or out? Does it require the support of every other school? Or it, needs the majority? A, it needs a majority plus one. So okay. four. So it has to be uh, five. And how many have voted so far? Well, it, it was five to one okay. to, to move it forward. So. Um, even if one had not voted, uh, I believe, I'd have to read the bylaws, they wouldn't even move forward in this step. Okay. So, I mean, it's very, very conceivable. I mean, everybody's meeting board meetings tonight. We'll know within the next two days because the board meetings are happening, how, how it voted. But, um, you know, we never know what the board are going to do, obviously. The entire superintendents, they were very um, confident that this would happen, that there'd be uh, the votes to, to remove waverly. Are we doing that because one of the other things that you can look up on the on the internet not just the sportsman thing but the conference championships and you, that goes all the way back to 1976 77 and on those years uh, there there are three schools that pretty well dominate waverly shell rock 19 out of all those years we 13 decora 10 new hampton one and old line one we we and waverly shell rock actually split it two of those years mm -hmm. uh, so the competition, do you feel like the competition is getting one-sided? Um, I, I don't know if I care if that's just one side. I believe, you know, we're all competitive. I think this is what we have to look at as demographics. The way we show up is sometimes growing between 20 to 40 kids a year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're breaking even, we're growing by a few, losing a few each year, and then the some school districts are losing 10, 20, 30 kids. You know, this is the, this is the argument New Hampton's having. They're not going to get bigger. Where the shutoffs are going to be, the Hamptons are going to get smaller. So the gap continues to widen. And I think that's for their own self preservation of saying, hey, we've got to do something before it gets just kind of. We do know uh, that um, the conversation is in the conference meetings that, you know, they're going to will have other options of conferences they can join as well. So I think, you know, that there's possibilities for all this. That, that's the next, my next question. What, what is there? They express what they would they would do if they didn't leave. They had they chose to leave. Even. They have not. I mean, you can speculate that. I speculate at the table, but yeah. I I just know they mentioned that they obviously have options they'd have to look at. But there are options actually. I think that they want to necessarily exercise. Um, you know, we kind of sometimes we always love to just leave it as is. But I I think it's now had a critical mass. This is something that predates me. I mean, this is not something you know. We walked into it with the with the issue with baseball, but. Before that, when I walked in my first NEIC conference meeting, there was a pretty heated, passionate conversation by O-Line with some of the things around the conference, the disparity in numbers, the sportsmanship, these things. And o was very adamant. That's one of the reasons they left was that the inequity, uh, some of the sportsmanship pieces, and they, they ended up joining the North Iowa Cedar League. Um, I was just talking to the O-Line superintendent here the other day about that. We were just debriefing some of it. And so, uh, no, this is every year we've talked about conference expansion because we're too small. Every year we call schools and they say we're not joining because we have a school of 2,300 kids in it. And so then we're allowed to The only school that was interested in joining our conference was Mason City at the time. Yeah. And we rejected that because New Hampton, we're all kind of close to those. We're not going to bring out a school district with 3,000, 4,000 kids. They, they ended up forming that new uh, the Iowa Alliance, Iowa Alliance yes. which actually looks like it makes sense from yes. a competitive standpoint as well as travel time. Uh, Waverly is bigger. Uh, however, these numbers are, are arrived at. They have 596 is the high school numbers or something. So that's what they call, um, they use the beds numbers. It's a, they're 9 through 11 enrollment. 9 through 11? 9 through 11. That's the number you're looking at. 9 through 11. At uh, Decor 431, we're 397, 316 for Cresco, and then 265 and 260 for Wakanda and New Hampton. So I mean, they are substantially smaller. Uh, <coughs> Is that an issue for them? Soon? For for the, the Wacan Crestwood in New Hampton? Or, oh, I, you know, absolutely. Just one, yeah. If you look at, at the nine schools that are Upper Iowa, they're they're going to be able they're going to be able to compete more equitably, I guess you'd say. 
mm -hmm. uh, with with them. Yeah, that's a time. whole time might be a little bit longer. That's a conversation about Rye as well. There's some concerns mm -hmm. that some of the in high C schools are going to bring a pretty good size. You know, Crestville mm -hmm. is pretty good size. You know, when a thousand, I think, I don't know, Walcom, maybe 11, 1200 kids. It, you know, and then now they're looking at districts of playing like Turkey Valley, um, you know, Postville, while well, Postville's a little bigger, but, you know, Southland, some of these are pretty small districts. So I know there's conversations. They're wanting to divide the upper island to like a small, medium, large divisions. Um, so I think there's, you know, so I can't speak to this upper island piece. That's just what I was made aware of in the previous meeting. But uh, again, as, as we came through, the, the conversation was uh, very much the superintendents had a desire to maintain the NEIC and expand it, but they also knew it. We really admitted this as much as well in the meeting. They, they understand that there's not going to be conference expansion mm -hmm. with Waverly. So even Waverly admits that as well. I just want to add that I have gotten several phone calls from former alumni that live here in Charles City that say, oh, we've got to stay in the NEIC, you know? So um, I, I'm just throwing that out there. That, well, I was surprised. I was getting I was getting phone calls about that, but we were also looking for a superintendent. So there, there you have it. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess my my concern is the number of ifs. But we have two years. This this doesn't take, take effect, effect for, two years, yes. for two years. So yeah. the ifs will all get worked out in those two years, correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, so it, pending this resolution, if it is removed. Invites will immediately go to these new schools to ask them to, to join the new from us from the conference from the NEIC. Well, right. Yeah. I mean, when I say us, I mean, yeah, NEIC. From, from the NEIC conference. And really, what it is, it's the, the official invites, but it'll also be the, the relationships. Like, there's some schools I've been talking to, there's some schools the core has been talking to, that New Hampshire has been talking to. So, we'll be you know making those phone calls and we're already having those conversations, you know, like you said, if. And the challenge with this is the if is, you know, David is, you know, the superintendent may say one thing, but can they get the board on board, you know, and, and do it that? So that is, but I like the statistics of it. When we're talking to six schools, you know, the, the, the chance of us landing one is good. So the chance of landing two is, you know, not bad. You're telling us tonight that you, you've talked to six other non-conference schools. Yeah, I'm thinking in my head. Uh, not me personally, but us, us as a group, if I count it up correctly, I believe so. It's either five or six. I, I can't remember if that. There's one they said they were going to talk to. I don't know if they talked to yet. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's all about geography. You know, I'm talking to people close to us there. But keep in mind, I've got the relationships. I talked to five schools by myself back when we were trying to start the new conference. Mm -hmm. So I already built those relationships. So just being in touch with them as well. So. Mm -hmm. And the, the maximum travel time, if we some of those would be um, I don't see what yeah don't don't quote me on this but I, the ones I'm thinking of there's one I'm not sure about uh, but I think that's a very iffy one but all the ones that we've been talking to that are very feasible uh, for us I'll just speak for us without being far from what we're doing for walk on right now mm -hmm. it's still be less than the walk on distance and you get one of them is two of them are very very close so do we yeah. need to uh, make a motion to move forward with this? But that, that's the the recommendation. It just it just is one of those things that it's just bugging you, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Do you yeah. want to roll call it, David? Sure. Okay. Well, first we need a motion. Sorry. I make a motion to direct the superintendent to vote and sustain the resolution to remove Waverly Shell Rock Community School District from the NEIC. This is aligned with the recommendation of our community task force, which studied this matter two years ago. Is there a second? I'll second. It's been moved and seconded to direct the superintendent to vote and sustain the resolution to remove Waverly Shadrack <laughs> Community Schools from the NEIC. This is aligned with the recommendation of our community task force, which studied this matter two years ago. Any further discussion? All those in favor um, say yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Right House. Yes. Fox. Yes. Dr. Show. No. Mac. Yes. Berglund. Yes. Four one. Okay. See um, number sixteen set the date and time for a calendar public hearing. I feel bad we just proved the calendar and I'll bring a change to it. it it's a small uh, procedural change. 
So we negotiated with the uh, interest based writing group. We've had a 25 minute duty free lunch, which just caused a lot of messes for our teachers. It just, you know, it makes more sense. And I think the three teachers on the uh, on the board can agree that 30 minutes made more sense. Um, however, when we did that, it, it changed our instructional minutes that we're doing. And we had plenty of extra instructional minutes built in, but it's going to eat into about two days of those extra instructional minutes. But this is just a, we have to set a public hearing for this. This is a regular calendar amendment. It does not change anything at all. It does not change. You know, start time, date, or anything like that. It just it, it's a just a clerical piece for you know state recording and just of the extra hours that we build in for early uh, late starts and, and early outs. Okay. When is graduation? The first day of the calendar. It is not Memorial Day weekend. Right. I know that. May twenty second. That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah, we kept it. We moved to order, so it's not Memorial Day weekend. Okay. okay. So a motion on this. I make a motion to set the date and time for a public hearing on a proposed 2022-23 calendar revision for Monday, April 15th. 25th. Oh, so what did I say? 15th. April 25th, sorry, oh. 2022 at 6.15 p.m. in the high school library. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to set the date and time for a public hearing on a proposed 2022-23 calendar revision for Monday, April 25th, 2022 at 6 15 p.m in the high school library any further discussion all those in favor say aye aye, aye. those opposed say no five zero all passed consideration of the consent agenda is there a motion to approve the consent agenda i'll make a motion Second. So we moved and seconded to um, approve the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor, is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Consent agenda is approved by zero. Okay. Um, big ideas. Anybody have any big ideas for tonight? No big ideas. Well, I'm glad that we have negotiations settled. That's I think the big That's idea. A big deal. So and then everybody seems happy. So yay. At least they're not angry. That's right. They might not be static, but they're yeah, pleasant. Okay. Um, important upcoming dates. Uh, tomorrow, superintendent interviews. I sent you all email. 2.30 for us? Yeah, 2.30. I sent you some of the questions and and um, resumes and things like that. Um, okay, April 14th, Finance Committee meeting at noon. April 25th, board meeting, high school library. Okay. I can't wait. Meetings adjourned at 7.39 p.m. Thank you.